Welcome to Beyond Bite Wings, the business side of dentistry, brought to you by Edwards & Associates PC. Join us as we discuss how to build your dental practice, optimize your income, and plan for your future. This podcast is distributed with the understanding that Edwards & Associates PC is not rendering legal, accounting, or professional advice. Listeners should consult with their business advisors before acting on any of the information that is shared. At Edwards & Associates PC, our business is the business of dentistry. For help or more information, visit our website at enassociates.com. Hello and welcome to another episode of Beyond Bite Wings. Today we are going to talk about employee retention credit. Now some of you out there may be asking me, what is that? Well, that's basically the full form of the acronym ERC that you guys have been hearing a lot about and that led us to making this episode so we can answer some of the questions that are out there for you guys. And before we actually start talking about this episode, I want to tell you guys something. There's a reason why we didn't touch upon this credit so much in the past, and that's because a lot of the clients, especially in our industry, applied for the PPP round one loan. And the rules back then basically stated that if you qualified for the round one of PPP loan, then you're not going to qualify for this credit. However, there was another bill that passed around the last week of December of 2020, which basically told potential appliers that you can actually qualify for the PPP one loan and this ERC credit. So without further ado, we're going to be talking about this. Jump in. And we'll just jump in. So So like everything else in 2020, the rules changed. Yeah. So it it was a change. It wasn't a clarification at the CARES Act time in April, late March, whenever that was, you were not allowed to take the PPP loan and the ERC credit. And as of the end of December, you are now allowed to do both. So that's what the last few months have been rapidly trying to understand the credit and how you can utilize the credit and how much is the credit and especially how it interplays because it does interplay with the PPP loan and it greatly complicates that whole forgiveness process. So that's the fun of the ERC. It's not really a complicated credit if you take it alone without the PPP forgiveness, Mm -hmm. but most of the dentists got the PPP loan. And so it makes it, it adds an element of difficulty. So, and it can mess up your forgiveness. It could mess up your forgiveness depending on and vice versa. Your forgiveness can mess up your credit. That's one of the issues that we don't, know how it's going to be rectified because a lot of dentists applied for their forgiveness before the ERC was allowed and they used all of their wages toward forgiveness, which was the the smart thing to do at the time. But that didn't leave them any wages left for the credit. And you have to, the credit is based on your wage amount. So if you used all those wages for your PPP forgiveness, that doesn't leave you any because you can't double dip, Mm -hmm. doesn't leave you any to apply for the credit. So that becomes the complication. I remember back in the early days of April and late March of 2020, I think we evaluated some clients whether it would be better to take the ERC or the PPP at that time. You couldn't do both, like you said. And we almost universally determined that it was better to take the PPP than the ERC. Right. Then on December 27th, they changed the rules and allow you to do both. And then I guess one question that everybody has is, well, in retrospect, can I go back and change where I'm getting the credit for prior quarters? And the answer is yes. The answer is yes. Yeah. Yeah. So that's the easy answer. You can go back and get the credit retroactively. It's going to require some filing of amended payroll reports, which is Not going to be really an easy process or a quick process, but it can be done. Got plenty of time to do it. So most people are going to qualify for the credit for a second quarter of 2020, possibly second and third, maybe even second, third and fourth. But primarily second quarter of 2020 is the main one. And you would have three years basically from when that first report was filed to amend it. So you've got plenty of time, thankfully. What you have less time to do is file for PPP forgiveness. And so it all has to be hashed out kind of before that point, as far as I am concerned. And how do they qualify 
for the ERC. So to qualify, you either had to be shut down under a government mandate, either fully or partially, or you had to have a decline, a significant decline. Those are the words, a significant (laughs) decline in your revenues, essentially your patient fees between one quarter of 2020 and the corresponding quarter of 2019. And again, Primarily, that's going to be second quarter of 2020 that is going to qualify for that decline. And it had to be a decline of 50 percent for 2020. Now, all the rules changed when you get into 2021. The decline doesn't have to be as high. So we'll maybe talk about that later. But for now, when you look at the second quarter of 2020, if it was 50 percent or more of a decline from second quarter of 2019, or if your practice was mandated to be closed, then you qualify for the employee retention credit. So were most of the clients in Texas mandated to be closed? Yes. So that's going to be the difficulty in the closure is figuring out what is a government mandate, what's fully closed, closed, (laughs) what isn't. Yes, in Texas, we were definitely mandated to shut down by Governor Abbott. So we're not going to have any problem qualifying here under the government shutdown. It wasn't a long period of time. It was about six weeks, five, six weeks. That is going to qualify. And some of the counties were a little longer. We're looking into that. But you're going to have to research this state by state, location by location to see if you were ordered to close. And what doesn't count are stay at home orders. Those are not considered closures of your practice. If a official gets up and recommends that you close, that does, that's not going to count. So if the ADA suggested that Dennis close their practices, that does not count. That does not count. Okay. That does not count. And for instance, in Texas, the Texas Dental Board extended the closure. Abbott started the closure, the governor, and then the state board extended the closure. And our state board is authoritative, so that counts. But in some of the other states, that's not the case. So they can tell you to close your practice, but they can't force you to. You don't have to abide by it. That is not going to be considered a government mandated closure. So even though you had to close, I mean, the reality was you had to close for nothing, if not public pressure, because people were saying you're killing everyone by being open. Right. So you were persecuted in the closing. That's not going to qualify for you for the credit, unfortunately. So that's kind of the negative side of it. But you may qualify under the decline, the revenue decline, and that's really easy to calculate. It's very Objective number, we like that one. The closure is a little more nebulous. It takes a little more research. I think a lot of the doctors feel like they were forced to close by the government, but they aren't necessarily going to qualify, especially because of the stay-at-home order. So everybody thinks, oh, we had stay-at-home orders, so we couldn't open. But by and large, dentists are part of the medical field, and the medical field is considered an essential business, and essential businesses weren't mandated to close. So the stay-at-home orders didn't apply to essential businesses. So then again, you weren't required to close. So it's really, it's kind of an unfortunate situation, but that's that's the rules and there are extensive examples on the IRS website about what constitutes a closure and what doesn't. So there's not a lot of gray area that they've left us. So on those examples on the IRS website, are they objective? I mean, do you agree with most of them or, or, or are they what would benefit the IRS? They're objective for the most part. I mean, it's just the public pressure aspect of it. It doesn't come into play. And that's the unfortunate part. But for the most part, it it does say whether you were allowed to be open, mandated to be closed, it is pretty clear and it is pretty reality based, I would say. I don't think it's necessarily in their favor. And even in Texas, even though we were mandated to close, it was only a partial closure. So it still qualifies us. But uh, I don't think any dentist, as far as I've seen yet, are going to qualify for a full closure because even in Texas, we were only mandated to stop non-emergency procedures. So we were still open as essential business to do emergency procedures. So it's only a partial shutdown. Now, if the revenue drop is more than 50%, then they wouldn't have to worry about that. Right. Right. And you may qualify under both. So if you were closed before, you know, somehow you started cl- being closed in the end of the first quarter, there may be some days there that you would qualify. So any wages you paid during that first quarter 
during the closure would qualify for the credit. But then if you get into second quarter and you have the revenue drop, you're going to qualify for the entire second quarter. And it continues until your practice recovers to where you're back up to over 80% of prior year in, in that given quarter. So you're going to get it for a minimum of two quarters. So if you meet the requirement second quarter, you're going to get it at least second and third quarter. And then if your practice wasn't recovered enough in the third quarter, you might get it again for the fourth quarter. And then all new rules apply for 2021. And, and if you get back to that 80% number of the prior quarter, mm-hmm. y- you still get it for that whole quarter. Correct. Okay. Right. And you mentioned quarters. How exactly will, let's say I'm in this situation, I want to take advantage of this ERC credit. How am I going to get this credit? How are you logistically going to get the credit? Uh, logistically and even, is it going to be on my 1040? Oh, or okay. You, you see. Yeah. No, it's going to be on your 941. Okay. So it's a payroll credit. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's a credit against wages, essentially, and you can't use it for any wages that you used for PPP. You can't use it for any wages that were federal sick leave credit. So none of those are can't you get you can't get double benefits on your wages. But let's say you didn't get a PPP loan. Let's just keep it simple. Mm-hmm. You didn't get a PPP loan. Your second quarter was down fifty percent over prior year. So that quarter is going to qualify, and you get the credit is up to ten thousand dollars per employee. And the credit's 50%. So potential of $5,000 credit per employee for 2020. Yeah. I, I may I sound see, a little... I see glazed. I'm, I'm a little it. confused <laughs> about... So the credit is 5000 What's the 10000 for then? The 10000 is wages. The ah, credit is on $10,000 okay. of wages. Okay. That's the max wages I you see. can use. Okay. And the credit is 50% in 2020. Different mm-hmm. rules in 21. It's mm-hmm. for the quarters that you were down. So yeah, but the max credit in 2020 is on ten thousand dollars. The so full the total year. is five thousand okay. dollars per employee. So if you have an employee that you paid, say, let's keep these numbers simple, you paid them six thousand dollars in second quarter, you could get a credit of three thousand dollars. If you're in the third quarter, you pay them six thousand again, you can get a credit of two thousand dollars because it's capped at five thousand for the year in 2020. So you're going to probably get the full 5000 for the owner. You're going to get 5000 for most of your staff, certainly your hygienist. And, but that's if you don't have to coordinate it with the PPP forgiveness because you've got 24 weeks of wages that mm-hmm. you're going to have to oh, pull pieces out of for that PPP forgiveness aspect. So even if you didn't return to 80% mm-hmm. of prior year collections until the fourth quarter, mm-hmm. You would still just get the five thousand per employee, right? You're most likely going to max out at, in two in, quarters. In two quarters, yeah. at that five thousand okay. dollar number. Okay. Yeah. Now, when you get into twenty one, it's actually the the ten thousand of wages and the five the ten thousand of wages is per quarter. So you get to start over every quarter. That's already a much more significant number, and it's seventy percent of wages. So I can only do this in increments of. 10 because that my brain won't calculate <laughs> 70 percent so if, <laughs> if you pay someone ten thousand dollars in quarter one you would get a seven thousand dollar credit if you paid that person again in quarter two you would get a seven thousand dollar credit assuming you meet the qualifications to apply for the credit and you can get the credit in both 2020 and 2021 correct and i guess multiple quarters now in 2021 correct okay right wow yeah so when does it end for the 2021 is it June 30th. The, June 30th. June 30th. June 30th. Okay. So it's first and second quarter of this year. Now, is there any indication in the new administrations talking about stimulus that might be extended again? I haven't heard that. Have you heard that? No, I have not. Okay. I have not heard okay. that that might be extended. I've heard some things might be extended, yeah. but I've heard no chatter on this yet. Okay. We'll see. Okay. I mean, they can't not change their mind on anything, right? So right. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> Now, since we were talking about URC being related to the PPP loan, especially regarding the forgiveness part, I heard recently that for people that qualify for PPP one but kind of forgot to apply for it, can they still apply for it now? As long as they were in business on February 15th of 2020 and had employees, Mm -hmm. then yes, they can apply for round one. Right. Just because they didn't apply, that doesn't prohibit them from applying. I I think the confusion is you can't get round two if you didn't apply for round one. So it kind of sounds like you're out of luck, but you can 
go for your initial round one application still. They reopened it. Because after everything was said and done and we all thought they were going to run out of money, Mm -hmm. well, with the the additional money that they put into the program, Mm -hmm. there's still money there. Mm -hmm. You can still apply now and still receive round one funds. I see. So for the clients that originally, let's say, received the ERC credit last year, they can now apply for round one as well. They could. I see. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because like you said, Robert, the you had to make the choice in the beginning between ERC and PPP, all these acronyms. <laughs> and I agree the PPP option was by and large the better choice. But there were a few that would only qualify for a small amount of PPP. And in that case, it was better to go the ERC route. So they could conceivably come back now and apply for their PPP if it's worth their time. Yeah. Depending on that what that dollar amount is. Yeah. And that's going to be the same with this ERC as well. When you're going back retroactively and figuring out if you're going to get this credit, the fact that you qualify for the credit is not the only consideration because you're going to have to evaluate the amount of the credit, whether it's worth the trouble. In most cases, I think it will be, especially just kind of depending on how your dates play out. But there are going to be some cases where the credit might be, you know, $2,000. Is that worth it? It's going to take a lot of calculations, a lot of forms filling out and waiting so i think there is a dollar threshold where you go i'm just not going to hassle with it i think some people are going to be looking at very large credits though on the other hand so it's definitely valuable and definitely worth it i think the big takeaway is you need to get someone to evaluate it and if you haven't applied for forgiveness you need to hold off and do it together I think the PPP application is going to be much more complicated because of this credit if you want to fully utilize both, because you're going to have to use your rent and your utilities and things like that that we thought we weren't going to have to use. Because you're going to use a lot of your wages for the credit. Right. So you can't use them for both the PPP and the credit. Correct. So if I carve out some of the wages to ERC and leave the remaining wages to PPP, that amount's got to be at least 60% of my PPP loan. And then I need to have 40% of other costs, other allowable costs, to fill up the rest of that PPP loan. If not, then you have to decide, okay, am I going to forgo mm. some forgiveness or am I going to forgo the credit? So it's a lot of decision making. But one thing people should remember, if they're going to forego some of the forgiveness, it's a 1% it loan. It is. <laughs> it is. So you're basically saying that if I'm the person applying for the people who applied for the PPP loan mm-hmm. and is thinking about ERC, I cannot do this myself. I think some could, but I think it's pretty complicated. Really? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure I could. I well, what about my payroll service provider? Let's say I use a company right. like ADP or Paychex. Can right. I not have them do this? Right. I think that is a misconception. No, you cannot have them do this. They can calculate the wages. If you tell them when you qualify and the dates you were closed and the periods you qualified, they can calculate the wages for the credit and they can even probably file the amended form for the credit. But they can't calculate whether you had your revenue drop and how much you want to use of the wages and how much you need to reserve for PPP. They can't do all that analysis. So I think you're going to start and probably already have gotten solicitations from the payroll company saying we can do this for you and they can logistically fill out that form for you, but they can't do the background information and the calculations are fairly complex to make sure that you dot all your I's and cross all your T's because you're dealing with the SBA. And if you do your PPP forgiveness wrong, then you're getting into SBA fraud and all kinds of things that are, I think, a little on the scary side. And if you do your PPP forgiveness too soon and claim all your wages, then you can't count those wages toward the employee retention credit. Well, not necessarily. Uh, Right now, sort of, yes. But the AICPA is actively lobbying the IRS so that you can kind of do a separate calculation to calculate your PPP based and use only the amount of wages you had to. So you can pull out wages that you didn't need to use for your PPP application and use that towards the ERC. But those regulations have not come down yet, so we don't know. Okay. So it's certainly better to wait than to hope they're going to allow that. I would, if you haven't applied, don't apply. And you did say something while ago about waiting, and I know this was out of context. But speaking of waiting, how long are people going to have to wait to get the credit? To actually get the cash. (laughs) Well, are they going to get the cash or are they going to get a credit against future payroll taxes? Well, they can do either one, but I would absolutely recommend they take the cash. To get the credit is going to cause all kinds of 
I think IRS notices and issues. So you can, if you get the credit, you can theoretically short your payroll tax deposits against that credit, like sort of an advance payment. But by the time you file the form and the IRS gets notified of the credit, you've already missed your payroll tax deposits. They're going to say they're late. So they're already sending notices. They're already sending yeah. notices. You're going to have to fight it. You did everything correct, but you're going to have to fight the battle with them, and that's not worth it. So much better to just ask for the refund and wait for the cash. You're going to you're going to come out ahead in the long run, but you're going to have to wait. I would say from the time you file the form to actually getting cash in your hand, I'm hoping it's only nine months. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Sorry for that information. So that's my ERC advice. That's patience. Good. Yeah, it's. I, I have a lot better understanding of it now than I did two days ago. I'm glad you do. No, <laughs> I'm just kidding. Just kidding. <laughs> I'm getting a better handle on it too. But it, it's taken a lot of actual, actually sitting down with calculations and seeing how it's going to work out. Yeah. So I can imagine. It's just confusing and complicated. Mm-hmm. And I guess, I mean, do we have any clients that you think would try to get the credit on their own? All right. Well, that was great. I honestly think this was a great episode for our listeners, especially because it's so current and they will be getting contacted by the payroll service right. providers, by the lenders. Well, not so much the lenders, but, you know, other professional advisors. So thank you. And uh, we look forward to listening from you guys. Again, feel free to reach out to us at info at e and associates.com and that's and with an a and d and uh we'll talk to you guys soon thank you thanks for listening today be sure to subscribe to beyond bite wings on your favorite podcast platform For more info, you can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn, or reach out to us on our website. You can also shoot us an email at info at eandassociates.com.